I'm joined now by Peter York, who is a man of words, of course, and he's put a few of them towards a book of pictures, indeed of photographs. And they're fantastic photographs by a photographer who I feel rather ashamed never to have heard of before. Um, he's Jim Lee. The book is called Arrested, and it's Peter York who's here with us now. Peter, welcome to BBC London. Thank you. Why haven't I heard of Jim Lee? I'll tell you exactly why. Because during your formative years, yep. or your cultural consumption years, he was doing TV commercials. Right. Because it paid more... And it got the children through school. Um, so he started off as a teenage boy photographer doing sexy, speculative, very inventive uh, fashion photographs, which were really composed as film stills. Uh, and But then he saw well, the glowing beacon of 1980s uh, TV commercials ahead of him, uh, and he thought that will pay the school fees. It seems to me that the photography, particularly the 70s stuff, is very much... Vogue of the moment. Um, it is very similar to what to you know. If you if you look through those fashion magazines of now, they're all trying to make everything look like it's Studio Fifty Four again, and it's louche and it's sexy and it's over the top. And his stuff is exactly like that, isn't it? Well, ask yourself the question: <laughs> Who did what first? Sure. I mean, if you look at, um, it would be quite wrong to name names, but but if you. Ooh, Swish through uh, all the things in any shiny magazine, the 60 pages or so yeah. of luxury brand ads, you'll see a lot of knockoffs of Jim's work. What was his story? Because he was a London boy, but he ended up in Australia. How did that work? Well, um, he was a London boy who ended up on Austro in Australia because he rebelled. Rebel, rebel. He's not really a rebel, but he was re rebellious in some ways. He was a posh boy, wasn't he? He was a posh boy, no question. But he rebelled against his father, who was a fixture of MI5. <laughs> but he didn't know. He thought his father just went on the train to London from the home counties, and he didn't know quite what he did. So his father was an MI5... Yeah. Executive, if yes. what, if what, if yes. what, what I mean, he be. was a stalwart of MI5 through four DGs, right. as they say. And do you know when it was all revealed, he took the late teenage Jim to the spy who came in at, at, out of the cold and said, "That's what I do." <laughs> really? Mm. Seriously? Yes, How but fantastic. he hadn't. But they hadn't got on well before, and the the the, the basic divide was that Jim like many other quotes-unquote creative people, was dyslexic. And they didn't understand then what dyslexia were, was. And so, from the point of view of a very Martinet-like father who expected Eton, Cambridge, Secret Service sort of career trajectory for his son, he thought, well, if he can't even do common entrance, he must be either stupid and he's, he's not stupid or annoying and perverse. <laughs> so we must beat it out of him. So, so he, he ran away to Australia on a this ten quid, he calls it ten quid cowboy sort of offer that was intended for kids from the slums who wanted to better themselves. And he landed in Australia. And did he start? Did he go with a camera? Or did he always no. To... He well, he did all these picaresque things that people do. He worked in a rubber hose factory. He <laughs> drove one of those great trucks across the red desert with an Aborigine. He did all those wonderful picaresque things. But by night. He was getting into Sydney's Bohemia. I didn't know there was a people. Bohemia in Sydney. There, oh God, there was. I mean, you, you go back in the the world, you know, the world of those Australian memoirists and look at the what they ran away from. What, there the was Clive bit, Jameses. Yeah, the, the Clive Jameses. Of course, there was a there was a burgeoning Bohemia. This is younger than Clive James, but there was a burgeoning Bohemia. Of course, it's you know. You've got, you've got to have one. It's such a long way away. You've got to make your own, even if it's not quite the real thing. Now, he was a good-looking guy, wasn't he? Mm. I mean, he kind of looked like a fashion model or a film yeah. star or whatever. Johnny, John, the, the, the first Johnny Depp look. It's the Johnny Depp look. Before Johnny. Even. Before Johnny, yes. Um, and he liked a pretty lady as well, by the way. And he liked it. a pretty lady. <laughs> he liked, well, and they liked him, and quite a lot of pretty ladying went on. Did it? Yes. <laughs> And he's photographed a fair amount of pretty ladying in the book, it must be he's said. He's photographed a lot of pretty ladies. Most, but not all of them, have their clothes on. There are some who haven't got their There are some on. who are vaguely unclothed. There are but some only who are a vaguely bit. unclothed in a sort of vaguely early, you know, West Bank way. Did he become well-known here at this time? I yes. mean, was he known... Uh, you know, He was known to... I mean, I tell you somebody who was uh, very well-known to, Anna, Anna Winter. Right. So... 
because that was all part of the wonderful thing that was Harper's and Queen. Yeah. The uh, you know that those early moments of Harper's and Queen in the seventies and eighties when it was rather oddly fantastic, and it was neither a fashion magazine nor a social magazine, but something else again, almost by accident, as a function of the people who ran it. And in that period, he met Anna Winter, who he sort of followed her to New York. And then he went on to direct advertising mm. adverts. Mm. Advertising adverts, that's what he directed. Advertising adverts, yes. In the 80s. He did uh, lots of those. Did he stop making photographs? Mostly, not entirely. That's why you didn't pick up yeah. on him because at, at that point you were where well, you were an absolute sponge for culture. <laughs> you were taking in stuff all the time. Because I feel he a bit was, about, ashamed of myself. He was I doing I mean, it. You have to claim so, I knew no, all along. You have to have been um, a shiny mag um, fashion editor of the late seventies, or the same thing back in this century. Right. Because that your formative period. He was doing something else. What's he doing now? He's doing more of the same. Well, he's doing art now. It's Is now he? it's art. Yes, but everybody's Once doing art. But the now, moment, Peter. the I'm moment you're doing art it. somewhere. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I keep well away from that side of things. But it is it's all things. You know, conspire to the condition of art. And he's doing art now. And what happened was, he got accidentally. He sort of rediscovered himself, or got rediscovered, and he got. He got an exhibition in a sort of um, city boys club, and then he got and then he got taken up by the wonder that is Hamilton's Gallery, which sells very big, very shiny photographs to big shiny people for lots of money for lots of money, and um, that made him famous in his own world all over again. Why did you want to write the book? Are you an old friend? Mm. I am, and so I got forced into doing it. <laughs> but you've done it with... There's a great joie de vivre about it, about the writing and about the pictures as well, Well, there's, I a, think. there's a lot of fun represented there. There's, it's a quite lot an of, edgy fun. It's, a, it, it's well, in the earlier it's, stages. It's quite an edgy fun, and there are some things which, by the lights of their times, were, I think, even a bit rude. But it's quite an edgy fun. There's quite, quite a bit of sort of un unarticulated political thought or at least political comments so one of his most liked most bought images is a sort of patty hurst one yeah um uh, so in that sense it's edgy fun and it goes way beyond the margins of what ordinary fashion photographers thought they were there to do Talk they were there to do to make the girl look very pretty and to show the dress very clearly so you could see every stitch Talking a bit more kind of generally, but inspired and provoked by the book, do you think that it's time we reassessed... There's there's a period of time which I think has got, you know, from, from its very inception, got very bad press, which is sort of 1973, 1974, that kind of before punk mm. um, era, which actually is starting to look really rather wonderful. It's starting to look really rather wonderful. It's certainly starting to look... It, it always looked wonderful to me. And when people talked about the 70s, by which they meant the early 70s, as the land that tastes for God, I would say you were clearly living in a different world from me. And <laughs> mostly they were. <laughs> because if you were... If you were working at the very top end, then people were extremely fastidious, extremely clever, extremely inventive. You know, it wasn't at all tasteless, it, rather the opposite. People were taste-obsessed. Just think I mean, yeah, it's, of St. Brian. Well, and Tommy Nutter yes. and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, mm. the, you know, and, and Jagger, you know, in his wedding, you know, just sort of yes. after his wedding. And that, that period, that kind of... Just a bit before Studio 54, you know, those London places. I, don't know, I can't remember what, where people would have been going then in London, but it, it, it's starting to look very exciting. It starts afar. to look very exciting, and you see that reflected in the best fashion photography. Yeah. Because, amongst other things, it starts to take place in absurdly aspirational places. The George Sank. Everything's in the George yeah. Sank. And, do you know, instead of Kate and Naomi... You've got Marie and Jerry. Yeah. So it's when it's glamorous, early 70s is very, very glamorous indeed. Well, I think this is a very glamorous book. It's quite a sexy book, and it's I think it's a, a fascinating book. And a snip at 75 quid. Oh, cheap. 
<laughs> Easily cheap. Twice that would be cheap. <laughs> You've never knowingly been cheap, Peter. <laughs> It's Jim Lee. It's Arrested, but it is a very, very big and handsome book, I'll tell you. And Peter York is the man behind it. You're doing something else as well, aren't you? Or is it too early to talk about that? I'm doing something else, a very Londonist thing, because I'm a very metropolitanist person. Yeah, but I heard you and talking it'll... about going to the seaside the other day. Oh, God, yes. And I was sort of, well, that was... Uh, I was practising to think, <laughs> what if I had a bit on the side, a place on the side? But I... I'm not sure I could really do it. I'm a very, very deep metropolitanist. Well, <laughs> ditto. It's 24 minutes past two. Let's play a song.